Howdy folks, welcome back. We are being plagued by gnats. It's unbelievable. You almost can't work outside. I've never seen anything like it. Anyway, we're gonna try to get through this, but it's, it's pretty rough. This is part two of the Ford E350 project. And last time we figured out that it had a bad injector driver module. A viewer named OC left me a comment, said he had an injector driver module from a F350, left over from a vehicle that they used to own. I think it belonged to his son. And if I wanted it, I could have it for a pretty reasonable price. He couldn't test it, but he was pretty sure that it would work. Man, these nets. So OC is from Louisiana. He sent me along a little note. It says he's enclosed the IDM injector driver module. And as is the custom in Louisiana, he sent along some, and I actually had to look this word up. Apparently it's pronounced lognop. And I guess it just means like a bonus, some kind of Creole word. <laughs> Never heard that one before. Anyway, he basically says that he sent along some spare parts for a 10.5 inch Sterling axle. So it looks like there's a set of bearings and a wheel seal and I don't know. One, two, what is this? Okay, so it's a set of bearings and an axle gasket. So that's pretty cool. We'll probably use that at some point. But most importantly, he sent me an injector driver module. And I wanna go see if it's gonna work. I guess that answers that. So if you guys remember from the last video, the trucks actually had the injector driver module replaced twice before. And basically it lasts for about 25 miles and then the, the IDM is dead. So there's a lot of speculation in the last video that it had a bad injector and that that injector was in fact killing the injector driver module. So I threw a amp clamp around that primary feed wire for the IDM and I'm just checking the amperage here. I wanted to see if it in fact had a bad injector. And I was too lazy to find a way to sync this. So, you know, basically to figure out which pulse belongs to which cylinder. So I just threw some cursors up here and I measured from pulse to pulse. It's about 23 milliseconds. So I was doing some quick math here. So assuming it idles at 650 RPM, that's 10.8 rotations per second. You have to take that times four because each cylinder only fires every other rotation. This is a four stroke engine, of course. So anyway, that'd be 43.33 pulses per second. One divided by 43.3 is 0 0.023 seconds between pulses, which is exactly matching what we have on our scope. So that means that each one of these peaks here represents one cylinder firing event. And you can see they're all the same. There's not one that's you know noticeably higher. The shape of the, the thing seems to be pretty Consistent, you know, we don't get a lot of detail with this cheapo hand tech scope, which is one of the drawbacks to it. This is a injector current ramp or, you know, waveform. This is actually a known good I pulled off of my own truck and it's kind of an interesting pattern. So I believe this is what they call a peak and hold. So the IDM is going to send out a large amount of current to force the solenoid to open. Then it's going to start pulsing the solenoid basically reducing the overall voltage and overall current. And then at some point, it's actually gonna shut it off. And the solenoid's gonna stay open because the coil is saturated. 
And then after it waits a certain amount of time, it's going to pulse it again at a much lower current, much lower voltage. And so it's peak to open the solenoid and then hold to keep the solenoid open. And then it shuts the, the solenoid off and everything goes back to nominal. So I apologize, these numbers don't make a lot of sense because I accidentally had my scope set for a 10 times attenuator. These Handtech scopes are, they're handy, but I've noticed that there's like a lot of buttons here that will automatically reset the thing to a factory default. And for whatever reason, the default seems to be a 10 times probe. So anyway, what it's basically telling us is we have about eight amps of current at the peak going out to the, the injector. So I'll see if I can pull up another one here. Uh, let's see. It's also pretty clunky the way you have to save and recall these waveforms. I need to get a better scope, I guess is what I'm getting at. This thing was really nice when I was doing you know, machine tool repair because it's, it's easy to, to throw in a bag. It's not that expensive. If I lose it or break it, it's not going to be the end of the world. But it's pretty clunky. It's, it's not well suited for automotive use, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, let's go to our cursor. So this is a waveform I pulled off of this truck. And you see it's exactly the same amount of peak current. The ramp, or the, the slope here is a little bit different on the hold side. But I don't see any you know, major problems. If we had a shorted coil, we would see a, a vertical here, a vertical line, basically meaning it's just drawing 100% current until the current limiting kicks in. You don't see that, you see a nice ramp up during the saturation of the coil. So I'm saying that there's nothing wrong with this injector coil. So I actually tested all eight just by moving the clamp from wire to wire and they're all basically about the same. And again, this is that feed wire to the injector driver module. And this is from this truck and you see that Every time it fires an injector, the pulses are pretty much even. We don't have any problems where one's dropping out or pulling too much current. And you know, these, these power strokes always sound like a bag of hammers at idle, but I can tell that this truck is not missing. It's running fine. Okay, one more thing, and then we'll, I'll leave the comments alone from the last video. And don't let me sound like a downer, guys. I, I appreciate the comments, I really do. I try to read them all. If you have questions, I try to respond. The comments have gotten a little bit out of control. Uh, I'm not able to respond to everybody's comment anymore, but I still try to read all the comments. Anyway, don't let this discourage you from leaving those comments. I really appreciate that. Last time I pointed out that there was a chafed wire in this harness here. This is the chassis harness, and this bulk connector here connects it to the engine harness. And this red, or sorry, orange wire was, was rubbed through. A lot of people said that they could see arcing while the engine was running. I went back and watched the video. I see what they're talking about. You can definitely see something flashing over here. I don't think it's arcing. I think it was probably a piece of lint or spider web or something that was just flapping back and forth because of the fan running. I don't think it's possible for this to arc even if the wire was completely stripped of insulation. A lot of people said it was rubbing on a bracket. I don't know what they're talking about. Like a metal bracket. So there is a metal bracket up here. But that's, you know, it's a couple of finger widths away. And then this right here is a plastic housing. So this is a magnet. It does not stick. Sticks to the bolt, does not stick to this. So even if it rubs on this connector housing, it cannot arc to it. I also pointed out that this blue wire was kind of rubbed through. You know, I don't think it's possible for them to arc between these two wires because the voltage is just too low. This is only 115 volts pulse DC. It's not, you know, it's not 10 kV like a, a spark plug wire. It just isn't capable of jumping that kind of a gap. I think at, at atmospheric pressure, 110 volts only capable of jumping like, I don't know, a few thousands. It's less than the thickness of the insulation of one of these wires. Well, folks, I just, I don't know. There's a lot of variables here, but I cannot see anything right now that would cause this injector driver module to fail. I, I just, I can't. There's, there's nothing wrong with the communication between the PCM and the injector driver module. It runs fine. What we're seeing on the scope matches what I'm seeing on a known good as far as current draw through the injectors, current draw through the IDM, everything looks normal. 
I don't even know that it's a high current event that's causing this problem. The only clue we have is that the customer says that you know the engine was shutting down one bank of cylinders prior to the IDM failing completely. And I believe on these 7.3s that if the IDM sees too much current being pulled by any one injector, it shuts down that entire bank. I don't believe it can shut down just one injector. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. Anyway, I guess the, there's a lot of things that could cause that high current to happen. So we could have a short to ground in this 110 volt supply wire. We could have a short to ground in one of the control wires. So the way this works is that the injectors on each bank share a positive 110 volt feed. So each one of these control wires here, the IDM closes it to ground to complete the circuit. So they all share the same common feed. Now, I would think that if we had a short on the control wire here, I just don't know. I would think a short on the control wire here would cause a problem with the injector. It might cause the coil to burn up in the injector. Now the other kind of variable here is that all these wires are shielded. So I'll show you guys in a minute, but inside the harness there's a foil tape and that's connected to ground. That's to keep the thing from you know being noisy and causing interference with your radio or whatever. So if any of these wires inside the harness are chafed and then they contact that foil tape, that's a direct short to ground path. So that's a variable that we have to keep in mind. So I just don't know where to go from here. You know, do we throw the injector driver module back in, send it out down the road and say, hey, we can't see anything wrong. And then 20 miles from here, it blows up a $300 injector driver module. Or do we spend five hours to pull the valve covers off, look at the under valve cover harness, do an inspection on that, probably go ahead and replace it. You know, I don't know. There's a good chance we'll, we'll pull those valve covers off and find nothing wrong. So I don't know. I hate to throw parts at it and time at it that it doesn't warrant, but something is causing this problem and I haven't found a smoking gun. You know, we just haven't had that there's your problem lady moment yet. And uh, that kind of bothers me. So I don't know. I think we're just going to kind of do something. We'll follow our gut and we'll see where it leads us. So I had put some liquid electrical tape on these terminals here just as a temporary fix, but now we got to do it right. So I went ahead and put some shrink tube around the orange and the blue, which were the two worst ones. I think I'm going to go ahead and do this purple with a yellow stripe or whatever it is, pink with a yellow stripe. So I'll show you guys how I do this. So inside this connector is this little comb and that basically keeps the keepers from opening up. So you gotta pull that little comb out of the connector and then grab yourself a little tool, pocket screwdriver or something. I'm using this little Lyle terminal pinning tool and you're going to pull back the little plastic keeper and the pin comes right out. Pretty simple. Slip a piece of this adhesive line shrink tubing over top. I like to grab these with pliers so I don't burn my little fingies and hit them with the heat gun. Here we go. Make sure it clicks. Looks good. 
I think we got one more. This brown wire here. So that's gonna be this one right here. Okay, stick that back in there. You hear that click. That's it right there. Now let's see, how's that go? Let's go like this. There we go. No broken keepers, no damage to the connector. It's a good repair. Okay, that's a lot better than the liquid electrical tape, especially for these high, high voltage wires or higher voltage wires. Oh boy, you gotta pull the AC line to get the freaking alternator out of these things. I don't know, I've never done one before. This is not a normal size alternator either. This thing is massive. Oh, probably because it was an ambulance. What is going on? I guess I better check the service information. Let's jump ahead about three hours. I have no idea how to get this alternator out of here. I'm thinking the only way it would happen is if you drain the coolant, took the upper radiator hose off, dropped the fan clutch off and took the radiator shroud out, then you might have enough room to pull this thing out this way. You may still have to drain the AC and pop this line off, I don't know. That thing is huge. Anyway, I chose to just leave it there and work around it. Same with the AC compressor. I just popped it loose and worked around it. And the valve covers are now off. But I didn't really find what I was expecting to find. The injector harnesses seem to be just fine. I'm gonna do a closer inspection. But I did find something interesting. This is one of the glow plug wires. And whoever installed this valve cover pinched it. It pinched it right there. And that's not good. I've looked it over. The only problem I see really with these valve cover wiring harnesses is this one glow plug wire that was mangled on installation. Now that's not good. Surely that glow plug was not working and it was kind of taking the whole system down. But it should not cause the problem that we're seeing with the injector driver module. All the harnesses look good, that the connectors aren't melted. I just I don't see any kind of carnage in here. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna replace the valve cover gaskets with these valve cover gaskets. Yes, they are made by Dorman. Yes, they are made in China. No, they are probably not the greatest quality, but I believe it's a superior design because they don't have that connector on the inside. Everything's one piece. So once we put these together and we put them together correctly, we shouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Now you gotta be careful. Guys in the comments were telling me they've had problems with these zip ties cutting into the wires so we'll check that real close uh, some of the things are a little dodgy but it looks like it'll work to me and I have these on my own personal truck they've been fine never had a problem with them so here's the setup this is one of the original injector harness connectors here's the other one they have this foil tape I peeled that tape back 
split the harness, cut the wires, and spliced in the new pigtail. So I'm not gonna show you guys step by step, you know, installing this pigtail. There's there's not that much to it. You know, clip the wires. I'm using my uninsulated butt connectors. People always ask me where I got these. I bought them a few years ago. This is the name of the company. I don't think they're in business, but they were a seller on Amazon. I'm pretty sure I bought them on Amazon. You can buy these kits like this on Amazon. I believe the actual terminals are made by Molex. This is the wiring diagram for the injector driver module to the injectors. So you see they have laid out the injectors here in the typical Ford fashion. So one, two, three, four on one side and five, six, seven, eight on the other side. But this is not a Ford engine. This is an international engine. And the cylinder layout is actually different from how Ford does it. So on these engines, it's even cylinders on the left side and odd cylinders on the right side. So if you look at this wiring diagram, you're gonna think, oh, I've got a tan, a white, a brown with yellow, and a brown with black. Well, that's not correct. In this harness, we actually have white, brown with blue, pink with yellow, green with orange, and a light blue. So we actually have this one, this one, this one, and this one. So don't let that trip you up when you're diagnosing these power strokes. They do have a different cylinder layout than the normal Ford setup. Well, I guess this one's a little bit easier to see, so I can show you guys how I did it. So, like I said, uninsulated crimp connectors and adhesive lined shrink tube. That's my preferred method for any kind of wire splicing. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you that it's the best method, but it works very well for me. So, that's what I do. Anyway, Go ahead and wrap the this cable around our control wires here. So this is a ground that goes all the way back to the injector driver module and it helps keep that tape, aluminum tape grounded. Now this is how they did it before. They just kind of doubled it back on itself. Oops, I forgot a wire. Yeah, we'll catch it with the other one. And we'll start wrapping with tape. So I asked in a previous video about Project Farm and testing electrical tape. Turns out he does have a test video about electrical tape and I watched it. It was interesting. It always comes up with pretty clever ways to test things without, by the way, without spending a lot of money, which I think is pretty cool. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. I was a little bit surprised he didn't try to test the insulating properties of electrical tape, but maybe that's a little bit too difficult to, to test, I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter, I guess. When you're all done, you end up with something like this. Cocooned in loom wrap and electrical tape. This thing should be good to go. Should outlast the truck, at least. Okay, I think we're ready to go back together. I got the valve cover gaskets installed. Well, the big thing we want to check for is just make sure we don't have any wires on top of the gasket so we don't get 
stuck like the last guy did. Looks good. The nice thing about these Dorman gaskets, they have a little shield here on the around where the bolt hole bosses are so that the wires can't go back underneath the gasket and get caught in there. So it looks pretty good. Getting the glow plugs hooked up is a pain in the butt. It really is. And I cleaned all this stuff, believe it or not, before I took it apart. You can hardly tell. It's pretty dusty. Now, the passenger side here is a... It's not fun. You got a lot of stuff in the way. That big alternator, the dipstick for the automatic transmission, this hose for the map sensor. I popped the, the downpipe loose here from the turbo and took the dipstick loose here at the back of the bell housing. There you go. Still, it just barely goes in there. Now the driver's side really isn't too bad. You can get that one in pretty easily. So I'm guessing that's what happened. They took the, took the easy one off the last time to make sure nothing was wrong. And they got it, got it tangled up and they put it back together. Well, I'm trying not to whine on the video, but it's just not a lot of fun working on this thing. And I've worked on E-Series vans with the 5.4 gas V8s. They're really not that bad. But this 7.3 is just so, so big. There's no access. I don't know what you do if you got to pull an injector out. I don't know if you can on this side. I don't know if you had to pull injector number three or injector number four. I don't know how you would do it. There's no access for that. Raise the cab, I guess. Almost would have been easier to take the cab off to do this job. Oh. Something else that I find interesting, this horseshoe shaped bracket right here, I'm pretty sure that should have originally held this large bulk connector for the engine harness and this small connector for the transmission harness. Probably should have plugged in right there, but wasn't being used on this truck. That's because it hits the alternator. There we go. Okay. Anyway, it has this other bracket right here. The problem is, uh, you hook it up on that bracket. Now what do you do with this TCM connector? I'm not sure what the answer is. There's no provision to attach it to this other bracket, so I don't know if it was supposed to stay there and this was supposed to clip in there and somehow that was going to be hunky-dory? I don't know. If it had a normal size alternator on it, it wouldn't be a problem. We got a puddle and I don't think that's water. Oh, fudge. What could it be? It looks like antifreeze to me. Oh yeah, that's cute. So that's where the lines would have run back to the rear heater when this thing was an ambulance. So it looks like those lines are rusted through. Yeah, that's not good. Boy, those are crusty. Little carrier's broken. It's not maybe the greatest way to do that. But I guess I see where they were coming from. Yeah, there's the AC lines. That's not the greatest way to do that either. Okay, well, I guess we better fix that. Okay, it looks like the heater hose is run right inside the doghouse here. 
So I think what we can do is just, yeah, we'll probably just cut these flexible hoses right here and loop it like what they did down below, but up here where it has a, a better chance of not rusting out. Then we can get rid of all these shutoff valves and all that garbage. Yeah, we'll have to drain the coolant and go ahead and do that. And I'll probably save these vacuum shutoffs, those are kind of handy. So I think, oh you guys can't see anything can you? Alright, in an effort to speed this process up, here's what we're going to do. I just pinched the lines off with some hose pinch off pliers. Fantastic tools, if you don't have some, get some. Then I removed this elbow from the previous block off. And we're just gonna loosen this up here. Shouldn't be any coolant in here. I've already drained the lines out underneath the truck. So it shouldn't make a mess inside this guy's cab. Hopefully. I guess if it does, we'll clean it up. Okay. It's going to leak a little bit because it's me after all. And we'll pop that guy off, let that leak a little bit. Now, those two things are no longer needed. Well, that's gone forever. Don't worry, I got a spare. good. Pull these off here. Oh. Oh, these are Matco pinch off pliers. I, I don't know who makes them. Of course Matco doesn't make them themselves but I don't know who the supplier is. Anyway I've had these since I was just a kid. Fantastic. Very handy tools. I've seen some plastic ones like plastic hose pinch off pliers. I don't think I would buy those. These ones are pretty nice. Okay anyway now I'm gonna get rid of this garbage from the bottom, tie up the lines. We'll tie up this thing so it doesn't burn up on the turbo or something and we should be good to go. So it's not pretty but it's better than all the coolant leaking out and there's just, I mean how far do you want to go with it? There's hard lines right about here so this is the easiest spot. Wish I had a little bit more. If I had two of those elbows we could do a little bit better job. Yeah, we'll see how we like this when we get it all done. This is the injector driver module that was in that truck. I was going to take it apart so we could see what was wrong with it, but I think I already figured it out. Everybody hear that? She's a little waterlogged. Well, I don't think we're going to save this one. So we need a way to keep water out of this injector driver module. I suspect it's rainwater because it's right underneath the windshield. So it's probably just running down on top of the thing. And then it's got this little vent right here, which from my understanding, the vent is a big problem on these. Anyway, what we need is a hat. So I scrounged around here and I found this plastic bottle and it's just about the right size. So I'm thinking, well, let me see what I come up with. So what I'm thinking is we'll dump this out into this other container.
Okay, we'll save that for later. I'll go rinse this out. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's not what the fine people at Turtle Wax had in mind when they designed this bottle, but I think it'll work. Now we better make sure we label this other bottle just in case. Yes, sir. That'll work just fine. Okay, folks. Everything's buttoned back up under here. I am going to leave these wires loose here so I can do some more testing on the injector driver module, which you see down there under its new hat. We'll see how that works out. Everything else is in here. And just for reference, the wires that we fixed way back at the beginning of the video are right here. And we got the back side of the engine all buttoned up. Looks pretty good. You can see our new harness peeking out there. And there's our repair on the heater hoses. Got all the shields and stuff back in. I think we're ready to put the doghouse back on and go for a little drive. I don't know if we fixed it or not. I hope we did. It's amazing how many tools you need to do a job like this. I put some of them away already, but that's a pretty good selection. Pretty good sized mess on the floor too. I'm still getting all these little peaks every once in a while in the live data. So I back probed the intake air temperature sensor, hooked it up to a graphing multimeter. There's nothing wrong with that voltage. The power is clean. So I don't know why we're seeing those little spikes like that, but I don't think it's anything to worry about. All right, folks, I don't know what to say. I just, I don't see any problems. I think we're gonna ship it. It starts good, it runs good. I'm gonna drive it around for a while, make sure everything is honky-dory, and then, yeah, I'm gonna tell, tell the customer to come pick it up. I just, I can't fix it if it's not broken, and at this point in time, it doesn't seem to be broken. So, I mean, we've got that used IDM in there. I think I'm gonna leave that in there for now, and we'll see how long it lasts. If it fails, then we'll go to a, you know, a for real rebuilt unit. You know, of course, there won't be any kind of warranty on this IDM, but, you know, it's not that expensive either. So, yeah, that's where we're going to leave it. Sorry we don't have a, a real definitive there's your problem lady moment, but it just didn't happen that way. And, you know, we did find something with those valve covers, so that ended up being worthwhile, but that was just, that was just pure luck. You know, I could have just as easily found nothing wrong underneath the valve covers and that could have been a total waste of time. So, I don't know. Obviously somebody's been there before. I found a bunch of bolts that were left loose or left out and guards that weren't put back on. So I knew something was going on. So it seemed like a good thing to do to take the valve covers off and that I do believe the, the Dorman gaskets are an upgrade. So yeah, we shouldn't have to worry about it in the future. I just, I don't think that was ever the problem. I'm not sure about this old IDM either. I mean, obviously it had water in it, but I think it may have been dead before the water got inside. I mean, there's no way that it would have gotten that much water inside within 25 miles and, you know, two of them in a row. I just, I don't see that. So I don't know if it can be fixed now. I mean, the board's conformally coated, so I guess there's a chance that it's still intact, but it's, you know, it's not good. So I know it's frustrating that we don't have a uh, you know, a definitive answer, but the truck starts, runs, drives. It's better than we had before, so I say we ship it out of here, move on to the next one, and if it comes back, it comes back. That's just, that's how it goes in this business. So, 
you know, intermittent problems are extremely difficult to diagnose, and this one seems to be intermittent to the point that it destroys a $250 or $300 module every time it intermittently happens. So, you know, how do you troubleshoot something like that without, without losing a fortune? I just don't think you can. So we did the best we could, and I'm okay with it. I'll keep you guys updated if we have any problems in the future, but for now, thanks for watching. See you next time.